Shouldn't he be playing basketball? Stick to basketball. Do they even have ice in China? Women's hockey is just boring, okay? Who wants to watch girls play? Go back to where you belong. Go back where we belong? This, this is where we belong. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today for Taking Flight, How Aviation Can Boost Toronto's Economy. My name is Gene Cabrell. I am the Executive Vice President at Ports Toronto, which owns and operates Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport. I am pleased to be here along with many of my esteemed panelists, Neil Pakey of Newport Aviation. Newport Aviation owns the passenger terminal at Billy Bishop Airport. Terry Mundell, President and CEO, Greater Toronto Hotel Association. Beth Potter, President and CEO, Tourism Industry Association of Canada. And finally, Jan De Silva, President and CEO of the Toronto Region Board of Trade and moderator of our panel. Before we start, I would like to cover off a few housekeeping matters for the viewing of this presentation. This webcast is being recorded and you can watch it or other sessions at supportbusiness.bot.com under webinars and videos. If your video is lagging, select, click here to select stream to view at the lower bandwidth. For any other technical issues, click request help in the bottom right corner. Finally, to ask our panelists a question at any point, you can do it through the Q&A on the right side. Let me start with a thank you on behalf of our almost 2000 employees at Billy Bishop Airport for the opportunity to open this discussion this afternoon. Many of these employees have worked tirelessly, not only during the most difficult days of the pandemic, they, they today continue to focus on delivering an award-winning and a safe journey for all of our customers. With that, just let me say a few quick words to set up the context of the discussion, given that the subject of the day is how aviation businesses, such as Billy Bishop Airport, can boost and support the economy as we emerge from the pandemic. By providing a gateway to the Eastern Canada and key markets to the United States, Billy Bishop Airport fuels tourism trade and plays an important role in getting people moving again and energizing the economy. On the Canadian travel sector recovery and passenger numbers, we saw Canadian airports as of November this year, sitting at about 50% in comparison of 2019. Strongest numbers coming from domestic markets and also seeing more recent growth in the US and international. It is important to note in the US market, in the United States, that that number is somewhere between 80 to 90% as it compares to 2019 traffic. Looking even more recently at data for the last seven days uh, for average passengers traveling in the United States, that sits about 84%. And in Canada, we sit at about 53% in comparison to 2019. These were pre-government -gov announcements yesterday. Specific to Billy Bishop Airport, we were the only airport in the top 20 in Canada to have no commercial passengers for 18 months. Having said that, although our restart and recovery for our airline partners have commenced only under a phased approach since September, we have shown growth month over month with us sitting at just under 40% when we compare November 2021 to 2019. Also very positive signs coming from our markets to the United States, which are almost at 50% of the 2019 levels ahead of many other airports in Canada. With that, I will turn things over to Neil Pakey of Newport Aviation. Neil will provide some interesting findings related to economic impact study that was recently conducted on the potential for Billy Bishop Airport. Afterwards, we will open the session to all panelists who will provide their insights on the subject of recovery in the tourism sector and answer a few questions. Neil, over to you. Yes, yeah, th thank you very much, Gene, for the introduction. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, there's so many joined us today uh, for, for this session. Uh, apparently there's over 100 people on the call. So uh, that's great. So for those who don't know, because I think there's one or two from Europe, the, 
you can see our airport over Jean's shoulder and over my shoulder. So we're very lucky to be in, at an airport that's really in the, at the heart of the downtown uh, business community of Toronto. Um, yeah, and today, uh, you, you know, it's, we wanted to discuss about the importance of downtown airports like Billy Bishop to urban economies and to share with you some exciting new data about the potential impact of our terminal airport to the wider region. Uh, as many of you know, um, Billy Bishop Airport is owned and operated by uh, Jean's company, Ports Toronto, and we're very pleased to partner with Ports Toronto uh, and together make the airport the best it can be, possibly for our passengers, uh, airline partners, staff and the community, uh, and, and we take all, the, all of that very uh, seriously. Uh, indeed, yesterday, uh, Ports Toronto um, launched the, uh, the electric uh, ferry uh, service, uh, which uh, is really uh, innovation at its best in terms of uh, where we stand today with our sustainability objectives. So congratulations to Ports Toronto for that. Uh, at the terminal operations themselves, I can speak to as the CEO of Newport, uh, we're the owner, operator, manager of the passenger terminal at Billy Bishop. Uh, so I've got the pleasure of overseeing the terminal operations at what is a very unique airport. And the terminal operations here are as unique as the location. It's an urban airport with incredible opportunity to use the terminal in ways that contribute to the community here uh, through activities, engagements, public art, uh, and so forth. Uh, I was just commenting to Jean before we started about the live music that we've got going on just now. And we've installed an inspiring mural as part of the Artworks TO program uh, in, the, in the terminal. It's, a, it's an artist, uh, Birkett uh, Keswer, and uh, who's one of the leading uh, female um, graffiti artists in Toronto, which is uh, another uh, part of this great city. Uh, so it's also a very vivid invitation for us, the message on there in the art to consider that we're not defined by what has happened to us, but really by how we show up in each moment. Um, so it's great to see people stopping and reflecting on that as they come through our terminal. We also recently launched an art gallery in the passenger hall featuring seven Canadian indigenous artists as a celebration of our country's indigenous history uh, through art reflective of our own country's diverse landscape and people. And that's what, really uh, really represents our city. We, we're in partnership with, the, as I say, with Ports Toronto and Billy Bishop Airport. And we, we get to contribute to and be a conduit for cultural richness of this city. Uh, we're a gateway for, to new destinations and for tourists coming to Toronto. And we get to display Toronto's and Canada's and cu culture and ideas within our, within our terminal. Uh, of course, uh, it's also the gateway to trade and economic growth uh, for the city. Uh, it's no secret that the past 21 months have been truly challenging our economies uh, and, and to innovate, find new ways of working and to find resilience in a way that we could never have anticipated uh, is all important. Our urban centres and the thriving business community around the terminal virtually emptied out overnight. And with businesses adopting new hybrid work, workplace models, we just wonder, you know, when are things uh, going to be coming back? And then we have the announcement yesterday, uh, which also is, uh, is uh, you, you know, it is what it is. And, and we're really looking forward to Q2, really, of next year, meaning March uh, or April onwards, really, to, to get uh, things really moving forward. Prior to the pandemic, the terminal uh, was servicing 2.85 million passengers annually helping them get to and from destinations around the region and across the uh, northeastern United States. That's our, our real catchment area and obviously bringing people in from those, uh, those uh, cities uh, is, is fundamentally important because the, the wealth they bring with them uh, keeps our economy going. It's a, it drives a constant supply of travellers for business, leisure and, and Increasingly, we see it's a combination of both, really. So when the, the business market come into our airport, uh, it's really the corporate tourism um, that, that really drives a lot of the visitor spend here. Uh, it, it obviously also you know, helps the restaurants by everybody eating out and keeps heads on the pillows in our hotels and keeps the conventions going, etc. So 
uh, that that uh, when, when people talk about airports as being like a business airport or a leisure airport, actually, more and more people do tend to do both when they're when they're traveling, and we see we see a lot of that. Um, the airport fuels our local visitor economy. In fact, prior to the pandemic, InterVistas had estimated. Uh, that the airport was contributing over $2 billion in net economic impact to our economy annually. And based on that figure alone, it's clear that any economic recovery needs to include the contribution of a local airport. But there's also an incredible opportunity here for Toronto, not just to recover, but to exceed uh, our ambitions. Um, so that, that study from InterVistas, the last one was 2017. So we recently commissioned York Aviation, a leading consultancy firm specialising in airport economic assessment to analyse the potential economic benefits of targeted investments at the airport and the terminal. Uh, the study looked at the possible impacts of strategic investments to develop air transportation services, uh, infrastructure, um, and, and the, the, the prime one that we, we consider is the planned US Customs and Border pre-clearance facility in the terminal. Uh, all, all of that development within the, the managed growth capabilities already in place as part of uh, Gene and Port Toronto's master plan from 2018. Um, and we, we found the results of the economic uh, potential rather astounding. The study showed that with that managed growth strategy aligned um, with, the, with the, the master plan, the airport has the potential to double its passenger volume. The, the economic contribution of this is not to be taken lightly. It's a total net impact of $4.8 billion in, uh, in Canadian dollars in, in GDP, uh, up $2.8 billion since the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and that's, that's achievable by 2025, 2026. So much of the impact hinges on the important addition of the, uh, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Pre-Clearance Facility. Well, that would expand connectivity by up to uh, 10 additional transborder travel links for our communities uh, to airports in the United States. And the net impact of the new travellers, new jobs, in fact, it could support 33,900 jobs uh, across the economy by 2025 in our hotels, our restaurants, our transit systems and so forth. And we were very pleased that, um, that uh, York University a uh, peer group reviewed the, the study by York Aviation and, and uh, that was really a good sense check for, for them to do that. Of course, it should be noted that the study is a future-orientated future uh, analysis, meaning that like all the research of this kind, the study makes several assumptions about market demand in order to calculate an estimate of economic potential. But it clearly demonstrates that in an increasingly global market, uh, air transport is undeniably the catalyst to economic growth um, and it's an important lever for, very important lever for post-pandemic uh, economic recovery. Uh, in addition to contributing to the GDP and tax revenues and job creation, the growth of this business will expand market access while it's also improving trade competitiveness and business productivity. In short, uh, by investing in and developing air transport infrastructure, Toronto can build a more robust, faster growing local and national economy. Uh, from the uh, York Aviation's report, it's clear that Billy Bishop Airport is an asset to our city, a powerful engine for sustainable uh, regional economic growth. But let's not forget the direct impacts. Economic development that facilitates trade, investment, generates tax revenues that fund government services. For example, the taxis contributed by the airport, just the taxis, could fund 470 Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers for a year. Uh, the same uh, could operate the University Health Network and Toronto paramedic services combined for about a week. So we're talking a lot of potential, uh, which is vitally important. Uh, the Toronto population, uh, for those who haven't heard, is projected to grow to over 8 million by 2030. Our economies will need to create jobs for a growing workforce and our government will need to collect more revenue to support critical services. But Toronto is also a dynamic business environment and an innovation hub that needs to be nurtured. In, in the last 20 years, uh, Toronto has doubled in size as an innovation hub. 
producing twice as many patents per capita in 2019 as it did in 2001. It also has the third largest number of fast growing companies in the Americas. A lot of the innovation is actually happening right here, right downtown. In round numbers, two thirds of the innovation taking place in the city of Toronto takes place within five kilometers of Billy Bishop Airport. Further, over the last 20 years, Toronto's overall propensity for air travel has increased by 50%, with Toronto Pearson and Billy Bishop developing as complementary airports. For example, Billy Bishop provides a convenient option for the time-sensitive travel to neighbouring business and innovation centres like Montreal, Ottawa, New York, Boston and Chicago. Pearson, of course, is the, is the, is the global hub for the region and it has the greater capacity to connect Toronto to international destinations and Canada's west coast. In short, Toronto needs a downtown airport. It needs one that helps remove barriers to business, that gets people home to the families more quickly and facilitates opportunity. I, I believe strongly that Toronto is one of the most exciting cities in the world. Um, I've lived here three years now and uh, I've never come across anywhere more diverse in culture. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's wonderfully livable for anybody who hasn't been on the call. I also believe that downtown airport will play a significant role in elevating Toronto's position on the world stage. In the wake of a global pandemic, this analysis shows we have a real opportunity, uh, an opportunity to be part of the solution to help Toronto's economic restart, but also build an integrated transportation system that supports an exciting future one in which hopefully the pandemic becomes a distant memory. If you'd like to see our report, it's been made available as part of this event invitation. It's also available on our website at www.newport.com. And with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Janda Silva, who will be moderating a panel discussion for us today. Thank you very much. Neil, thanks so much for those remarks. Um, again, compelling numbers any way you look at it. I'm, I'm delighted to be partnering with you on the event today. And let me state to our audience, Newport's a very important member and an incredibly valuable partner to us. Um, the resumption of the visitor economy, let me just simply say, is a critical pillar of our work for recovery of the region. Uh, in 2019, our city alone welcomed 29 million visitors who spent more than $11 billion in the city of Toronto alone. And much of that spending came from business travelers, people who came for a few meetings, a conference, or even a single afternoon. Those business travelers represent trade, foreign direct investment, and talent attraction opportunities for us. Neil's remarks highlighted the critical importance of Billy Bishop to our business visitor economy. And let me state, as the city's business organization, Billy Bishop is without a doubt a key source of competitive advantage for us. As a downtown airport allows quick cross-border business trips to happen, and it gives us an edge that many other urban simple centers simply do not have. It's also the perfect complement to Pearson that is our major source of international inbound visitors. So we've got kind of this one-two combination that really sets us out. I'm looking forward to digging into our discussion with our panel. They'll cover this, uh, these benefits from a range of options. Joining Neil on the panel to discuss this is Beth Potter, our great friend, the president and CEO of the Tourism Industry Association of Canada. Uh, for nearly half a century, the association has advocated on behalf of Canadian tourism businesses, promoting a sector worth more than $100 billion. Also with us is Terry Mundell, the president and CEO of the Greater Toronto Hotel Association. The association is the voice of the region's hotel industry, an industry that's so critical for the major events that we stand up in this city. He represents 170 hotels and more than 32,000 employees. This enables competitors to work together and raise the profile of the hotel sector as a vital component of our visitor economy. And finally, we have Jean Cabral, who we heard from earlier this afternoon. Jean joined Ports Toronto in 2011 and has had more than 28 years of experience in the aviation industry. He also serves as a director on the Canada Airport Council Board of Directors and the Small Airport Caucus for Ontario, 
all of these are important partners in our discussions about how do we how do we position ourselves for success as we move through recovery and reopen as we ultimately get to that point. Um, and with that, I wanna thank you, Beth, Terry, Jean, and Neil for your time. Let's get into questions. And to our audience, remember you can submit your own questions through the Q&A feature. I'll be checking my uh, email from time to time to pick up those questions, but let's get started. The estimates in Newport's re report are based on a return to pre-COVID travel figures. We know from data the board acquired that more people are coming into the city than earlier this year, but the volume is still far below 2019 levels. What do you all think it will take to get back to these pre-COVID levels and ultimately realize the full economic benefits derived from travel? And let's simply assume that this current fifth wave that we're in, we will get to the other side of that. So let's think about it beyond the fifth wave. Who'd like to go first? Terry, should we, we uh, point to you? Why not? Somebody has to start. Thanks very much, Jen, and the other panelists. It's a great opportunity for me to be here on behalf of the Greater Toronto Hotel Association. I think that we all know the challenges that we face going forward. And the thing I think sometimes we forget about as I look to the other partners on this call, I look to see the CN Tower and I see the lake, you know, the waterfront. And I think from time to time, we just forget what a scenic and fabulous city the city of Toronto is. And the one thing we know that Toronto has is a significant heart. It knows how to come back from difficult times. We've been here before. This is probably the toughest one we've been in a long time, but we've been here before. We know from the hotel sector that uh, quite frankly, we, we got behind a little bit in the eight ball simply because we were trying to bid meetings and events where the United States had already been open. They were open for business. We were six to nine months behind trying to bring any convention business back. Having said that, our goal is to continue to bring back meetings and events into our city. They're so important. If you looked at 2019, when we had a record year, there was over 400,000 delegates that came into the city of Toronto for just meetings and conventions alone. And that's a significant amount of money that comes into the city as well. So we need to get our meeting and convention sector back up and running. That's the important thing. We also need to make sure that our demand generators. So if we look at the, the heart of the city right now, there's not a lot of activity down there yet still. You know, we need to get, and I know Jan, the board has been a big proponent of trying to get people back, you know, down into the main city. We think it's important as well. We need to get to the demand generators so that we can get places, you know, like our festivals, our events, aquariums, all of our, all of our other facilities that people come to Toronto to see and do, the zoo, et cetera. We need to get them back up and running and we need to get them running full time. And, you know, we just started to get some of that back. And if I look at our occupancy rate, we were running at about 37% to the end of November for the year this year. But if you took a look at actually November itself and you look into um, December, we're actually running about 54%. So there was some good news there. We had some uptick. So clearly there's pent up demand. We just have to harness it and we have to get through this current issue that we have. Beth, your thoughts from a pan-Canadian perspective, because major events coming into Toronto is a feeder for other parts of the province and arguably other parts of the country. What are your thoughts on what it's gonna to take to get back to pre-COVID levels? Uh, thanks, Jan. And absolutely, I mean, Toronto is a gateway for not only our province, but our country. Um, and. I think what we need to uh, keep in mind is that there are lots of, of you know, kind of outside factors um, that we have been trying to uh, bring to the attention of the key decision makers. You know, making it simple to travel again, making it a seamless experience is one of the things that, that we're going to need to see in order for travelers to feel confident in returning at the, at the levels that they were prior to the pandemic. So, you know, we've seen changes to our proof of vaccination system as an example, uh, there's still work to do there in order to make sure that, you know, if Canadians are leaving the country, they, you know, their proof of vaccination system is going to be recognized. But we also want to make sure that we are able to recognize and, um, and, and accept proof of vaccination systems from other countries. The, um, the, the, all of the 
confusion around uh, what do you need to do in order to travel as far as testing, pre, post, quarantining, staying in place. I mean, right now we're in the thick of it again. We're all having flashbacks to earlier in the pandemic. But once those subside, our forecasted modeling shows that we can actually get back to pre-pandemic levels fairly quickly, but we need to remove the, the barriers to, to travel. And so that those are the kinds of things that we're working with government on to, to uh, mitigate them as quickly as possible. And of course, we've got that long border between us and our neighbors to the south and, and you know some continuity um, going back and forth across that border is key as well. And so working collaboratively with our neighbors to the south is, is going to be uh, imperative uh, for us to see the return of business travel, business events, um, you know, leisure travel, absolutely. But but business travel and business events, and to Terry's point, getting people back into the office and, and back meeting face-to-face, those are going to be absolute core foundational pieces um, for us to see a return to where we used to be. No, thanks, Beth. I, I just see there's so many parallels between the work we're doing with large employers on the return to the downtown core and quite frankly, the message is we need to keep it simple and we need to, to make it consistent. We can't have, you know, a hodgepodge of different approaches by, by province, by uh, jurisdiction. Our ability to, to keep it as seamless as possible will build uh, and restore confidence about coming back. Neil, your thoughts, any, any numbers you want to throw at us, any crystal ball you'd like to look at? Again, this is assuming the fifth wave will be behind us. We've gotten through the others. We will we'll work to navigate through this. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> the first victim to the mute button. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's obviously been hugely difficult, to say the least, 21 months for for tourism and the aviation industry. There's no, no doubt about that. And, and yesterday, uh, this week, the, the news of uh, further travel restrictions in the short term and, and the Omicron variant, et cetera. I mean, for me, uh, it really points to vaccination uh, is the only answer really at the moment. Uh, and, and the vaccination, uh, what we've learned is that the first dose is perhaps wearing off now and that's why people need the, the third dose, uh, also known as a booster. But, you know, that's probably going to continue and, and we shouldn't leave the gaps between uh, getting those uh, third uh, vaccinations um, from the second one. You know, it's... Uh, we should have a as, as fast as we can uh, have that because I think you know what, what Jean can talk to is is some of the things that are actually happening at the airport and the way you know Jean led a, a safe travels program here um, and and actually in terms of trying to reassure the market uh, <laughs> the airport is one of the safest places to be you know we don't have any uh, any employees who aren't fully vaccinated for for example and uh, so so you know the more we can get people vaccinated lift restrictions for all those who are the more quickly we can recover and, and welcome vaccinated passengers into the into the city so they can spend their money frankly um, and, and enjoy the experience that Toronto has to offer and rebuild our economy but uh, I think yeah we've taken significant steps working together with Ports Toronto uh, the terminal safe. The passengers can return to the sky with confidence as soon as we are, uh, as soon as we are uh, confident about the vaccination. Yeah. Well, and Jean, over to you. I mean, I'm happy to hear about the safe airport initiatives you put in place. I've been party to a number of the calls when you've updated. It's been been tremendous. But you've also been using this period of time during the, uh, the the pandemic to look at U.S. preclearance facilities at Billy Bishop, and that to me, is also another competitive edge, our ability to get that in place. So talk to us about Safe Airport, but also talk to us about how you see this uh, U.S. preclearance facility complementing regional economic development. And then, Terry, over to you on what that preclearance facility would mean for your members. Jean? And then I really appreciate the the opportunity. And I, if before we go into the CDP, I think I'll, I'll go back to Terry and Beth's comments, because I think... Uh, Back to your point on recovery, I think one of the things both of them touched on that was really helpful 
um, is the pent-up demand. Uh, you know, we saw with the easing of restrictions in the summertime, uh, the corresponding effect that had on air travel. And we saw those numbers spike during the summer and we saw they're going into the fall. So I couldn't agree more with Terry and, and over to Beth, specifically from a government policy perspective and the confusion uh, that exists. We, we know there's a direct correlation between some of the challenges that we see today on messaging around testing, uh, impacts associated with uh, pre-departure testing, arrival testing. So I think one of the things I would just say uh, before we talk about CBP is, is a recognition that our sector has gone well above and beyond and looking at, uh, from a risk-based perspective, uh, the fact that individuals coming to an airport, first of all, all of our employees are vaccinated. Uh, all of the employees on airport on the airlines uh, side is vaccinated. All passengers are vaccinated. Um, so we, we have one of the most rigorous uh, systems in, 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 in the world, quite frankly. Plus, on top of that, we have our buildings that Neil runs as an example that is, is top notch, uh, complete safety with tasting, testing programs. So I think it's, it's, it's about making sure that there's an understanding of all of that. Uh, so I just wanted to add that because I think Terry and Beth uh, really hit home on those pieces of what we'll need on the recovery side. Um, Pre-clearance, uh, it's a quite exciting file for Billy Bishop. Uh, it's a file that's near and dear to my heart. We've been, I've been working with the organization for 10 years and we've been working on it for 10 years. So, uh, you know, we see this as a key strategic initiative uh, to unlock uh, further value of this airport. And, and Neil talked about some of those significant impacts from a GDP perspective. Um, you know, our view is when you look at uh, some of the probably four key objectives that uh, that provides as far as improvements uh, and that we don't have today is is obviously customer uh, the customer experience when somebody comes through our airport and is pre-cleared uh, for those that have traveled into Newark as an example on a on a on a day where there's mass international arrivals you may be stuck if you don't have your your nexus card behind uh, long wait to, to wait time so arriving as a domestic passenger to the US uh, improves the customer experience also, key markets, Neil talked about 10 markets that we can get into. Uh, this gives us access to markets like New York LaGuardia Airport, uh, Washington National, and uh, looks at uh, that growing demand for the uh, downtown economy that we'd like to see. Uh, enhanced security is another aspect as well. And, and I think the biggest piece is growing trade and connectivity uh, from our city itself to these core markets that the city itself, uh, it, it can be a, a key generator for, uh, for the airport, for the city and for the region. Thanks, Gene. Terry, for you, what does the facility mean for your members? Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for that information, Gene. And there's no doubt that we're in a very, very competitive marketplace here. And one of the biggest pieces for whether it's uh, business folks coming into the city or whether it's leisure travel, the bottom line is you need access. And you need good access. You need barrier-free access. And I think one of the most important things here in terms of pre-clearance is we really need to work together to see if we can get this pushed over the goal line. I mean, 10 years is a long time to be working on something as, of, as, as important as pre-clearance. Uh, we all know we bring in, uh, again, conventions from whether it's New York City or Boston, Chicago, Philly, some of the places you mentioned, G. It is really important for us. There's significant markets. It's where we do a lot of our shopping for large conventions, and it's where we get a lot of the lift from. But we really need the airport to provide and work with us. And they've been great partners. Um, we're just in a bit of a different world here right now. Pre-clearance is a must, absolute must. For our business, it's all about, it's not only about access, it's for the consumer, it's how you feel about how you get to the hotel for us. It's all part of the destination. As we all say, I mean, you, you tend to leave your house with your suitcase and that's when your vacation starts or your business trip starts. And so having that access, having that seamless transaction, being able to work through pre-clearance, which is just makes it so much smoother, reduces time, is a must for us. We need any edge we can get, you know, to bid conventions and, and large meetings. And pre-clearance is a big part of that. Okay. Neil, over to you. Um, pandemic aside, what opportunities do you see for Toronto as an urban destination? and growing technology hub in North America. We know in general terms that the airport supports local jobs and tourism, but what's the unique role of a downtown airport like Billy Bishop in facilitating our urban economy? Yes, th thanks, thanks, John. You know, I was having a look at, uh, I was having a look at um, cities, global cities uh, around the world, and they have these comparisons, and, and, and it, it seems that only, uh, you know, if, if in, in the top 25 global cities, and there's only two that um, have uh, one airport. 
um, and that's Hong Kong and Singapore. And of course, they have very, very different, <laughs> different geography, as you know, John, uh, to, to, to the other cities. And, um, and so, you know, I think uh, looking at it through a lens of, um, of complementarity of uh, an airport network sometimes is actually a very useful thing to do because we start to appreciate how we all, how we all fit in together. And I, I would also include the likes of, you know, an airport like Hamilton in, in, in that respect. They have a role to play as well. Um, but they, they, you know, for us being the downtown airport, we're we're the one that's you know closest to the financial district, and the area that was stri- stri- striking to me in that um, in this in the economic impact study was uh, around the innovation, and you know that fact that Toronto's doubled in size as an innovation hub in the last twenty years, uh, and it's actually all happening. Uh, downtown or largely happening downtown it's uh, it's it's terrific and and that leads uh, to higher living standards it leads to better economic social health outcomes for the whole community um so you know we're a key enabler for for that and uh and, the, and as I said, you know two thirds of that innovation in the whole of the GTA area takes place in the city of Toronto and two thirds of that takes place within five kilometers of our airport so as technology, you know, becomes more complex and larger, uh, you know, international teams are needed to make progress and share risk. So uh, innovation is increasingly a team sport enabled by frequent, convenient, affordable air transportation. So, uh, you know, it's especially true for the types of innovation Toronto specialises in. Well, absolutely. And I mean, probably a little known fact is our innovation sector has had record funding throughout COVID. I mean, the, the amount of investment that's been coming into the market has been truly remarkable. And since travel reopened uh, in the fall, uh, again, the proximity for investors out of New York to be able to get into Toronto uh, has been has been a critical enabler for some of that. Uh, yes, we have a lot of deal flow that's originating in Toronto, but it's just that point-to-point connectivity really helps enable what's happening. And many of our innovators are, will have offices in, in close locations on the other side of the border. So so the airport is a critical connector for us with that. Um, let's talk about Pearson for a second. And let's talk about how Billy Bishop and Pearson, I mean, we view these as incredibly synergistic. And how would you describe the synergies that both of you share? And how does this differentiate Toronto region from other city regions? Jean, why don't we start with you and then Neil go over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jan. And, you know, I think, first of all, uh, Deborah Flint and her team, uh, you know, not only are they great to work with, but uh, we collaborate on so many different files and and uh, see ourselves very, very much as complementary uh, to the missions that we have itself. Um, you know, we look at some of the best practices when it comes to noise, uh, as an example, ground run up enclosure, which you see behind Neil's uh, shoulder there. Uh, Toronto Pearson is actually building one uh, in, in partnership with Mombardier as well. So, you know, I think from from the first perspective is is collaboration and co- and uh, connectivity directly on all the various initiatives that uh, we think can be complementary to each other. Um, also, when you look at some of the growth uh, that Neil referenced earlier in the city of Toronto, when you look at southern Ontario and you we, we look at the staggering growth that we're expecting from a population perspective, the Stoneline Initiative, the Southern Ontario Airport Network, uh, was brought together about six years ago. And it really talked about bringing together these assets uh, that are really important, not only to the city of Toronto, but to the to the region itself. And, and how do we make sure that these assets are, are put into the best position to succeed? So you, you speak about a place like Hamilton, uh, like Neil mentioned, uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, that's seeing uh, growth today. So it's about being able to serve the market that we're within. And I think one of the biggest pieces for us is, is as Neil identified every major city has at least two airports uh, that are serving and you know both of our airports uh, although very complementary we, we serve different missions uh, in the yeah. sense that ours are very regionally focused looking at uh, high frequency regional core markets uh, that drive a lot of the business uh, demand and and quite frankly the leisure demand that we're talking about and the changing demand that's going to occur post pandemic environment uh, as well so you know as we go along focusing on our connectivity uh, on a regional market Toronto Pearson uh, was focused on uh, on the on the global hub strategy. They are a great global hub, and they're going to be back there again. So we see our roles very complementary. Our catchment area typically is a downtown core, um, so it serves uh, complementary missions from our perspective as far as being able to connect people from the downtown core, uh, whether your business or or, or leisure or or uh, for uh, for personal use as well. 
Yeah, and it, it can't be um, underestimated. I mean, the importance of the, the volume of short haul travelers that are coming through Billy Bishop and the importance of being so close to the downtown core versus, you know, 40 minutes to an hour in traffic or up express trying to get from Pearson to downtown. I mean, the long haul international traveler tends to have a longer stay. So really critical for that quick turnaround. Terry, any thoughts from your perspective on the benefit of, of two airports? Well, I think it's it's very important that we have both airports, uh, again, from my perspective, coming into Billy Bishop in the downtown core leads you to a very close proximity to a significant amount of hotels, which are there, that uh, all of your travelers use. And then again, I think Pearson has been, has been something which we've worked with a lot, and it's a very, very important component as well, because it's a global hub. Mm-hmm. That global hub itself and, and some of the stopover programs that we've utilized before you know, really bring in some core business into the city that uh, we wouldn't normally have. So the global hub's really important. The regional hub's important as well. You know, both marketplaces, we need them both to feed. And the more people we get in to feed the hotel business, the more money, the more economic development that comes, you know, around the perimeter, the retail sectors, the restaurants, you know, all of the other types of events that we would have. So both airports are really important. They're both hubs in their own way, yeah. but they're really important to the economic vitality of our of our industry. Beth, your thoughts on the importance of both? I mean, from a tourism perspective, particularly for the tourism uh, activity that's happening where they're coming in to see some of the sites in Toronto, going on to Niagara, possibly going into Montreal, other other markets to experience Canada. Well, I think that, you know, having the, the, the two hubs are incredibly important. You know, what we see is that when people come uh, into Toronto, as an example, um, for on uh, business travel, um, we see direct foreign investment follow that. And that is, is really important. But it's not just in Toronto where that direct foreign investment follows. It follows into the region where it's the greater Horseshoe region or, or the rest of, of, uh, of uh, southern Ontario. So it, it's, I think it's a conduit to many other ways of doing business and ways of generating investment into uh, in to our country and into our uh, businesses and the, as you said, the innovations that, that we have on offer here. Yeah. Look, we started a little bit at the beginning, Neil, you touched on it about the exciting announcement about electrifying the airport ferry. So let's, let's um, focus in on climate and environmentalism and what's happening in the aviation sector. So love to hear some more about this electrification of the airport ferry, but also connect airlines. This is a new partnership that's uh, that's going to be joining us at Billy Bishop starting this spring. This is also an organization that's focused on trying to convert some of its planes to hydrogen power by 2025. So can you speak to the whole climate economy, climate agenda, and how that's playing out at the airport? Gene, let's maybe start with you and then Neil, over to you. Well, John, thanks for that. I, I think uh, one of the things that, uh, quite frankly, excites me every morning and getting up is talking exactly about that theme. And when you look at sustainability and uh, major milestone we accomplished yesterday with the ferry and uh, the electrification, and we really the roots of that was hearing from our community and hearing uh, and looking at our output specifically as far as how can we make a difference. So overnight, 530 tons uh, of greenhouse gas emissions removed. So you know, I think when we hear uh, Connect Airlines and their aspirations and where they'd like to be, these are the things that, the things that quite frankly excite us uh, from an owner and operator of an airport perspective. Um, our, our commitment and uh, our focus is relentless on ESG. It has to be. And I think all of us, uh, you know, believe in that on a regular basis. So, you know, a few things I would say um, that we have been working on, and we will continue to work on. First of all, our, our master plan, if you were to look at the airport master plan after two years of consultation, uh, one of the themes that comes out of it is, is our, our mantra, which is cleaner, greener and quieter. Uh, and that is something that all of us uh, focus on day to day. Um, you know, whether it was the Maryland Bell Taxi, whether uh, the Maryland Bell Ferry, whether it was uh, aircraft that do single engine taxi, as an example, uh, working with NAV Canada, our, our partners in introducing, uh, uh, you know, technology, specifically RMP approaches, where not only do you look at fuel efficiency, but it also brings down the emissions and cuts down the time, quite frankly, that aircraft are in air um, and, and obviously helps not only the environment, but also from a customer perspective. Um, you know, I, I think so. For, from our perspective, we, we are always looking for what we can be on the leading edge, uh, looking at reductions in emissions uh, related to noise as well. 
Um, and, and quite frankly, watching very closely, not only what's happening in hydrogen with aircraft, but being sort of agnostic to, to the technologies that are coming itself. Um, if you happen to have an electric aircraft today, we waive landing fees. So if anybody wants to bring in their electric aircraft to Billy Bishop, it is something that we, we encourage today. And we'd be looking forward to seeing those coming in uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as they're available to come in. Um, so I think, you know, when we look at it, it's a relentless program. Uh, you know, built right in from our sustainability program, and and uh, we will continue to make those efforts on a go forward basis. Neil, any comments from your end? Uh, yeah, no, thanks very much, and 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 yeah, we're very much in partnership with Gene and support Gene's uh, uh, efforts in, in this uh, in this area, and also great pleasure working with with Port Toronto and the and the community aspects. As I said in the introduction, you know, we we share a passion for that, and. Uh, we're doing complementary things with with our communities, but just on the, on this, uh, I might just link it back to the que- your previous question, Jan, about the uh, Pearson. Um, and one one of the uh, one of the things that you know we have to be mindful of looking forward uh, is is airport capacity. And one thing one thing that we've actually been doing well for Toronto is uh, uh, allowing Pearson to get the larger aircraft on the on the ground there. Uh, their runway capacity. Uh, you know, move, the, the the number of seats per movement has, has has continued to rise, and there's a sort of place for us with the smaller aircraft, and and Pearson with a larger aircraft because there's limited uh, capacity, in, especially in peak periods. Um, you know, looking forward thirty years, whatever. So you know, we have to get that long term planning right, and a big part of that long term planning is the sustainability piece. Um, you know, we we're doing our things and. In the terminal, uh, you know, there's the LED lighting now everywhere, and waste diversion strategies, and we have um, we've got a very very strong robust ESG strategy, etc. So, but but yeah, the connect piece that you mentioned is really exciting. They they uh, both both them coming in here and then and linking up new cities, uh, but also uh, what their, their their aspirations in terms of uh, hydrogen aircraft and. You know, you got to. You wonder how quickly we can do it. They're very, they're very uh, driven to try and do things by 2025, etc. And we have to try and help them as, as best we can. And, and it was also I read uh, uh, news of De Havilland taking an interest in, in uh, you know, the, the Q400 developments uh, and next generation of Q400s uh, potentially being hydrogen. So, you know, um, there will be no promises at this stage, but at the same time, I think everybody's hearts in it. Uh, and uh, convictions in it to 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 do what we can and uh, live up to uh, Port Toronto's wishes, being the uh, uh, the greenest, uh, the cleanest, greenest, quietest airport. Yeah, and we look forward to partnering with you on some other uh, initiatives as well uh, as we move through through this. Terry, question for you: Hotels. Uh, this is a question from the audience. Hotels are increasingly playing roles outside of tourism voting stations, vaccination stations, temporary housing. What other ways can we use hotels if a return to travel continues to lag? Uh, it's a very good question, and thanks for the question. It is, uh, without a doubt, uh, been interesting to watch, and I am so proud of our hotel community who who have really stood up throughout the pandemic. We, uh, we were taking on nurses staying at our hotels early in the pandemic and yeah. other healthcare workers and have worked our way through to where we are now today. Um, it's it's really been something fabulous to uh, to watch and pay attention to. I think there's a whole range of things the hotels can do. And I, of course, one of the things we are paying attention to as well is the environmental situation and ensuring that our properties, when they're reinvesting in their properties, that they're reinvesting appropriately. In terms of the pandemic, actually one of the conversations we'll be having here shortly you know, is whether or not uh, we can uh, utilize some of our hotels as we're looking at the government's looking to put more boosters in place and uh, hotels, some of them I think may have some interest. So we're just going to meeting tomorrow morning to have a bit more discussion around that. um, I think, which is, uh, which is a good piece. We'll see where that goes. Um, But listen, there's always great ideas around what you can do for hotels. We're so lucky to have such a great industry in, in the Toronto area. And they are willing to stand up. And we've seen that through the pandemic. And uh, I tell you, we're, we're very, very proud of, of their efforts and their teams. Yeah. And, you know, and we know uh, there's been some compa- capacity issues, uh, but let me speak 
pre-COVID, our big concern was not enough hotel rooms for the major events that we're bringing in. So um, our ability to continue to protect capacity, even if we're using them for other temporary things, will, will stand us in good stead as we think about uh, coming through the other side. Um, Beth, wanted to just uh, flip over to you for, for probably the last question we're going to have time for here. And, you know, we, we've touched a little bit about conferences, major events. Um, you know, one thing I've learned as we've looked at the visitor economy is these are booking, you know, three to five years out in advance. So what advice would you have uh, for us as the Board of Trade for what we can be doing in the moment to make sure that three to five years from now, we're on top of our game in welcoming the visitor economy back? Well, we just finished uh, hosting our national conference. And one of the things that we did was make sure that our communications were absolutely clear, clear, clear with our delegates. Um, and we also tried to incorporate as many protocols in um, place as possible. So we had, you know, zones, comfort zones, you know, people who didn't want to necessarily be that close, other people who were ready to hug, you know, that kind of thing. So just, you know, working creatively with um, our clients and working creatively with um, their venues to make sure that we can put on offer um, you, you, great events that uh, will continue to build the confidence um, in the meeting planners to choose our, um, our, our destinations as their destinations. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, um, you know, you know I, I talked earlier about, you know, return to work and you know, all of that is so important because those workers support the, um, the the infrastructure that supports our events, whether it's restaurants or um, or retail. I mean, it's without the day to day support of uh, the, the commuter uh, groups that come into the urban centers. We really don't have a lot to offer our visiting delegates when they come. So, so I just wanted to mention that to really try and emphasize how it all works together. We're all kind of keys in the same cog. Yeah. And um, we really need to, to not see these as isolated uh, topics of conversation or isolated solutions. You know, the, the more that we uh, encourage people to with you know, all of the protocols and, and maybe with a you know, an increase of rapid testing or whatever, whatever we have to do to get back to as normal uh, a routine as possible, that's going to help us, um, you know, encourage uh, meeting planners and, and, and big events to choose Toronto. Ontario and Canada as a destination. Um, and for all of those, I just, you know, Jan, I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but um, while this conversation has been taking place this afternoon, uh, our House of Commons just voted and passed Bill C2, which means that ongoing uh, subsidy support for the hardest hit businesses, whether it's in downtown Toronto or elsewhere, will be made available. It's now heading to the Senate for, for a vote tonight, but the House of Commons just passed it. And that's really good news as we continue to um, battle the consequences of the restrictions associated with this pandemic. No. Thanks. Let me let me connect a few few dots on what we've been discussing today. Let's let's start with with Bill C two and and helping those parts of the economy that have been most badly impacted. I think we went into this uh, thinking that the pandemic would be short, sixty days, ninety days behind us, uh, twenty one yeah. months in. Here we are, and what we've seen is the impact has been uneven. Uh, it's been uneven by sectors: aviation, tourism, airport operations. It's also been uneven by business districts. Uh, the Pearson Logistics Zone, which is where all of our e-commerce shopping is being fulfilled, they're at ninety-five percent return to their work environment. But downtown Toronto, which is our largest employment zone in the country, is sitting or was sitting in November at about thirty-seven percent return to pre-COVID levels. And as Beth said, we need to build confidence in those workers to come back in order to have that vibrant uh, experience in the city that also attracts major events to come in. So there's, you know, multiple problems that we need to be addressing as we think about uh, how do we move through an environment where COVID will remain a condition for the foreseeable future and build normalcy and protocols and tools to enable us to 
operate and build confidence. At the same time, though, we can't lose sight of the fact um, the economic impacts that Neil was speaking to that we benefit from with Billy Bishop Airport and the fact that we've got two airports, critically important for thinking about what the future of recovery and reopening is going to look like for the city. So long way of trying to get to a uh, connecting the dots on a really, really important discussion today. Neil, to you and the team at Newport, thank you so much for this really important body of work. We look forward to continuing to work closely with you on all things around the airport. Jean, congrats on everything you've been putting in place. And we're right there supporting you on the greenest, cleanest, quietest mandate that you're trying to fulfill. Terry, we were going to get more heads and beds as soon as we can. And thank you for everything the Hotel Association has been doing throughout the pandemic. I think our Dining venues are well appreciated uh, during this holiday season as we're trying to navigate through the next stage. So my thanks to everything you're doing. And Beth, as always, great to have you at the table to join us and talk about it from a pan-Canadian view, but also just to demonstrate how both the return to office and the return of the visitor economy are, are two sides of the same coin, and we've got to get this sorted out and figured out. So with that, I again, I wanted to say a big, big thank you to Newport. Um, Aviation is such a rich and complicated subject and, and something that we just can't capture in a single webcast. So that's why at the board, aviation is the single topic pillar for our upcoming transportation summit. On Thursday, February 3rd, 2022, just around the corner, we'll be gathering for this hybrid event. And our hope is that can be our first both fully in-person and online event. So let's get our booster shots. Let's uh, look at the protections that we need to put in place to make this happen. And at the summit, we're going to take another look at aviation as the important economic enabler it is, examining the future of not only Billy Bishop, but Pearson as well. And that's on top of other sessions on movement of goods, transit, transportation, infrastructure, and the overall future of transportation. If you're watching this webcast, I know you'll be engaged by our summit. So I encourage you all to buy your tickets online by going to bot.com and selecting events. To our panelists, once again, thank you for a tremendously important discussion and for really planting some new seeds of knowledge uh, for our audience. And to everyone, thank you for joining us. Have a tremendous evening. Stay safe and well. Bye for now. Yep.